<laughs> thank you very thank much you. for being here. Thank you. I didn't understand a word, but I hope it was nice. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And um, I've enjoyed everything so far, so I hope you're going to enjoy this. Um, the Futemas is called the Futemas precisely because its long title is the Vrishi Gosudastvene Hudojstvena Technicheski Masterskie in Russian, um, the Moscow's higher state artistic and technical workshops. And so, not surprisingly, it's known as the Futemas. The school was set up by government decree in, 19, in December 1920 as a specialized educational institution for the advanced um, artistic and technical training. It was created to prepare highly qualified master artists for industry, as well as instructors and directors of professional and technical education. The decree was signed by Lenin who regarded art as a valuable propaganda tool in the battle to win the hearts and minds of the Russian people. Lenin also considered art an important weapon in the fight to improve the quality of industrial production. The Bolsheviks, of course, were concerned to resuscitate the economy, which had been destroyed by seven years of almost continual military conflict, the First World War followed by the Civil War. In late 1920, as the Civil War was coming to a close, um, he is launched the policy called the New Economic Policy, known by its acronym NEP, <laughs> or NEP if you want to be more polite. And this was precisely to resuscitate the economy. The Vutamas was clearly part of this drive to reindustrialize Russia and to achieve socialism. The Vutamas has been called the Russian Bauhaus. And it's generally well less well known than its German counterpart. But like the Bauhaus, the Futamas was an important center for radical innovation in the artistic, in artistic education during the 1920s. It developed a new methodology for teaching artists and a new methodology for design. It revolutionized, in other words, the way artists and designers were trained in Russia at this time. Like the Bauhaus too, the Futamas had a very complicated history. It had originally been formed on the basis of the first and second state free art studios, which themselves had been set up on the basis of these pre-revolutionary art schools, which Jem talked about, the Stroganov School of Applied Art in Moscow and the Moscow School of Painting, Sculpture and Architecture. These had been abolished um, in 1918 and throughout its history, Futamas then went through several adjustments. On the basis of the first and second state free art studios, the Futamas was formed. In 1927, it was transformed again, reorganized, because it wasn't really doing its job well enough. Lenin thought it should be much more pragmatic, much more driven by design and more pragmatic objectives. So it began as the Futain, the Artistic and Technical Institute. And at the end of the academic year in 1930, it was, it was abolished. And each faculty became a separate institute, an autonomous institute um, within Moscow. And the Stroganov is back to being the Stroganov again. Now, the important thing about the Futimas was that it completely rejected the system of training for painters and artists which had been operational until this point. Um, and so for painters, this had included drawing from engravings a whole year, and then drawing from plaster casts from the antique, then painting copies of the old masters, and eventually, if you managed to get through all this, you were allowed to paint from the living models. The Futamas replaced this system uh, with a program based on the creative innovations of the avant-garde and in painting, sculpture, and architecture. And these creative figures themselves had, of course, rebelled against the pre-revolutionary academy. A lot of them had left the academy not having completed their training. As soon as they were able to, these artists abolished the old system. And of course, that opportunity came with the revolution of 1917. And the fact that during the ensuing civil war, 1920, 1918 to 1921, um, the avant-garde ran artistic affairs. The Bolsheviks just let them get on with it, in other words. They didn't have time for art. 
And this kind of work that the avant-garde did included running the art schools. As a result, the old structure of art education was abolished, and artists embarked upon the exciting venture of creating a new kind of art school which was appropriate to the new age, the new art, and which would create an art which would help to create, help to produce a new socialist environment. Now, this experiment did not immediately lead to the Futemas, but to the state free art studios, which I've mentioned before. These were um, set up in 1918 on the old premises, um, and they, and here you can see, in this one you can actually see the, um, I, well, I'm going to do it wrong, but the, you can actually see the state free art studios, Gosudasvni Svobodne Masterskia, on the, um, on the building. Um, the new studios proclaimed and practiced the ideal of complete artistic freedom. They provided only the very loosest pedagogical structure. This is the disorganization that Jem talked about. The studios were open to everyone without any entrance examination and irrespective of any student's previous education. Students were free to choose who they studied with, what they studied, and how they studied. Students could move from studio to studio in order to find the style of teaching or the style of art that suited them. If they so wished, they could even study in a studio without a supervisor, so completely free. In the words of the decree, the studios give the student the opportunity of developing his or her individuality in whatever direction he or she wishes. The plurality of approaches was enormous. At one extreme, there were figurative artists like Abram Arhipov, who produced colorful paintings of ordinary people, sometimes peasant women. I've chosen an atypical work here because it's a, a, a male peasant and therefore more typical of what he went on to paint during the later 20s. At the other end of the spectrum was abstraction, represented by Kazimir Malievich, suprematist canvases of colored geometric forms against white grounds. Vasily Kandinsky's swirling compositions, and Vladimir Tatlin's construction made from elements of material built up in space. In between, there were artists like Robert Falk, who embraced a cubist idiom, and Ilya Mashkov, whose works paid allegiance to Paul Cézanne. Most of these artists taught their students to produce work exactly in the same style. Some artists, however, tried to inculcate a more objective approach to artistic education. Mashkov, for instance, taught his students to exploit and identify different styles of depicting reality. He presented his students with a still life, which they had to paint naturalistically, then, a, then in a pointillist style, and finally in Mashkov's own neo cezanne style. Malievich adopted a similar approach. He taught his artists about Van Gogh, Cezanne, Cubism, Futurism, and then when they were ready, they were allowed to experiment with suprematism. Kandinsky also used a comparable approach. He, in order to encourage his students to acquire what he called an objective knowledge of artistic form and experience the inner freedom of the artist. Teaching about the relativity of styles represented an enormous advance towards an understanding of the role that the various artistic elements as well as the artist's intuition could play in the creative process. It was one step towards a science of art. Not surprisingly, however, this rather individualistic and rather anarchistic phase of art education was found to be ultimately untenable. And I quote, it became evident that the Renaissance ideal of the free studios didn't suit us. The single basis for the objective study of art was lost. The students only mastered the individual methods of the artists. Moreover, the different social and political situation of Soviet Russia was beginning to make its impact. People wanted to participate in the creation of the new socialist society. In 1921, um, the director of the Futemas, Ravdel, reported, a year of revolutionary life has forced us to understand that the artist is not an embellisher of life, but a serious molder of social consciousness and a responsible organizer of the whole of our everyday life. 
This realization was embodied in a student re resolution of June 1920, that art education be, should be organized along new principles in accordance with the country's present structure and contemporary needs. Accordingly, the FUTEMAS was set up to advance this more um, disciplined approach. Students, as this is the structure here, so students came in either from secondary education or from the RABFAC, and the RABFAC, the Workers' Faculty, Rabochi Facultiet, was there to ensure that students who had perhaps fought at the front or whatever could acquire a secondary education and enter um, the FUTEMAS. Um, then they had to all undergo the basic course. This was the key element. The, the, and this gave them an objective basis for the study of art. And it was to act as a kind of universal creative underpinning for production in all the arts. The basic course enshrined the notion of the unity of the arts and gave students a general introduction to the elements of art which was relevant for all the faculties. And it was compulsory. At first, it was about um, two years. Eventually, it kind of changed. By the end of the Futamas in 1930, I think it lasted six months. But it remained there as a kind of introduction to art, to artistic creation. The basic course, of course, was inspired by pre-revolutionary avant-garde artistic theory and practice. In particular, it built upon the general statement that summed up avant-garde thinking about the nature of artistic culture. And this statement was published in 1919, and here you have it here. And it identifies different components in the artistic process, material, color, space, time, form, technique. And all of these, with their ramifications, were used within the um, basic course. This, of course, this statement gave um, the teachers at the Futemas some general guidelines in formulating the basic course. But these vague definitions also left room for debate and refinement. And hence, the structure of the basic course um, was constantly changing. Um, Lubov Popova once said that the programs were changing every week. This, I think, may be an exaggeration, but it's very difficult when you look at the archive to actually establish precisely what was being taught, how, and when. Um, so this is um, an important problem. One of the earliest documents we have is rather an irreverent um, collection of prints, which was made by the students themselves. Um, it was produced anonymously, and it's dated 1920, although almost certainly was created in 1921, since it refers to constructivism, which, in fact, the constructivists in March 1921 rejected all artistic activity which wasn't directed towards making something useful. It's got very light-hearted, so I'm just going to go through, through it to give you some idea of um, the disciplines, but also the students' attitude towards them. They were as irreverent as students have been and always perhaps will be. So the first discipline was um, this, the maximum relevation of color, which was taught by Lubov Popova and Alexander Veznin. And the students wrote, the left front is now rich, Vesnin and Popova are our guard. And you see Popova shown with a lovely fur coat, and um, Vesnin with his very high, prominent domed forehead is, of course, um, pilloried here as well. Um, although Vesnin primarily worked as an architect, um, he in fact taught, and he in fact taught in the architecture faculty. He was an ab a very active abstract artist at this point, um, and both artists at this time were producing the kind of abstract paintings that you see here. The second discipline was taught by Alexander Asmierkin, and it was the revelation of form through color. The students were far more, less complimentary about Asmierkin. Um, he had remained wedded to a Cezannean idiom and figurative subject matter, which he encouraged through his teaching. But the students were appalled by his attachment to the demon alcohol. They said, A. Asmerkin comes running and rattles a bottle. He measures form through color, flooding the disciplines or swamping the disciplines, if you like. 
The th discipline number three was taught by Alexandra Exter. It was color in space. Um, this, there's no print in the collection concerning Alexandra Exeter, um, so I'm just showing an early work by her, which shows, in fact, how she used color in, um, in a, a composition, but also um, she was, by this time, m making both this kind of composition and much more completely abstract works. Discipline number four was color on the plane, and this was taught by Ivan Klune, Kloon had been a long-term friend of Kazimir Malievich and had been associated with Cubism and in 1915 had adopted Malievich's style of suprematism. But he also had started constructing sculpture. So he seems to straddle, if you like, the divide between suprematism and constructivism. The students are very angry about this. Kloon, they say, struggles along but works away. Am I not brother to the textile worker, he says? I swallow constructivism and Malievich's square. Discipline number five was taught by Alexander Reg Rodchenko called simply construction. Rodchenko was one of the founder members of the um, working group of constructivists. And he'd been producing um, a series of paintings concerning the line and had explored different qualities of pictorial texture or factura. In May 1921, he showed a series of hanging constructions based on pure Euclidean geometric forms, including the circle shown here. The verse reads, Maestro Rodchenko decided that the problem lies in the circle. What will happen to us now? Friends, help. So Rodchenko's cap was clearly evident, an evident feature of his appearance even at this time, as you can see from both the photograph and the caricature. Discipline number seven was volume in space, um, taught by Alexander Drevin. There was no print for Drevin, so he goes without a verse. I'm showing his abstract work. And some of the students' responses, which I think indicate how the students um, actually assimilated his approach, not to say copied it. Um, number seven, volume in space, was taught by Nadezhda Udaltsova. The verse reads, your lines have destroyed the whole of Cubism, Nadia, and constructivism has destroyed Picasso's textures. By early 1921, Udaltseva, who had been experimenting with, um, um, ab with abstraction, began, had begun to return to figuration. Um, and the print, which you can see here, depicts her with Drevin, her partner. Discipline number eight, which was um, the particularities of color as it relates to abstract compositions, was taught by Vladimir Baranov Rossini. And the verse reads, Baranov Rossini decided, um, and the implication is for no good reason, to change the culture of looking, and for this, he came from Paris to the Fouté Mass. The implication here, of course, is that he, he could have saved himself the bother. Um, and so um, anyway, not surprisingly, perhaps, he soon returned to the West. Now, although these disciplines provide an introduction to the elements of artistic form, you will notice that they were all clearly biased towards painting. They possess very little relationship to sculpture, architecture, ceramics, woodwork, or metalwork, the other faculties within the Futemas. Futemas staff recognized the need to create a more integrated basic course that would incorporate more material concerning volume and space and relate more closely to the work conducted in the other faculties. By 1923, the basic course had been reduced to three distinct areas of study, which were much more closely related to the practice of painting, sculpture, and architecture. So the first one was plain and color, absorbed the uh, disciplines relating to painting and graphics. Two, volume and space, which embraced all the disciplines that related to sculpture and volumetric construction. Third was space and volume, which included the architectural disciplines which had been incorporated into spatial construction. Between them, these areas of study embrace the basic visual elements of all the different specializations. Although there were subsequent adjustments, this remained more or less the essence of the basic course throughout the existence of the Futemas of Futein. In theory, all students had to study these three areas, whatever their future specialization. In practice, however, um, it's clear that this didn't always happen. 
um, especially in the early years, which still had a bit of disorganization from the earlier period. The discipline of plain and color absorbed the earlier disciplines that had related to painting and graphics. In addition to studying the properties of color and how they could be combined, students also examined different pictorial textures that could be produced by working both colored pigment and other materials. They looked at the interrelationship of form and color and the way that color interacts with volume and space on the plane or alters the perception of the surfaces of a volume by a viewer. The slide shows various exercises. Um, exercise number 14, for instance, um, draws six pairs of complementary colors. Exercise number three, draw the lightness of three colors. Exercise number 22, draw Oswald's single tone triangle. So it's both, the clear, it's both the theory and practice of color that they assimilate. Um, Gustav Klutzis taught color on the basic course, and here is his color wheel. And here you can see some of the exercises that the students produced um, in the slide. The discipline of volume um, was um, a kind of, a, where then students did this. They, you, you can see here student responses to the exercises the exercise construct a three-dimensional form from simple geometric volumes. And you can see spheres, cylinders, cones, rectilinear cuboid forms were combined to form a variety of different structures. Um, and here are some more exercises, um, to, um, more responses to exercise. For instance, um, on the, um, these two are student models reproduced in response to an exercise to create volumetric forms expressing weight um, and um, mass. And here you can see um, the right-hand model expresses um, density, while the left-hand model um, enhances the state of weightlessness of the pale elevated cuboid form while intensifying the mass of the dark base. So there were very, very, very different responses um, to these exercises. On the right is a resp student response to the exercise, create the form of a large closed volume. And the student varied the articulation of the closed volume that surfaces in order to give it a varied presence visually and to give it more visual interest. Um, Certain aspects of the exercises concerned with space possess strong affinities with the tasks understand, when undertaken for studying volume. And I think this can be seen in these um, images. Um, on the um, left, you can see a space on the basic course 1925. Um, and on the right, um, responses to an exercise concerning the formation and expression of mass and weight. And this again is in the space course. So it's volume and space, space and volume, and it's about the emphasis. So there's a, a strong um, overlap between um, these two. Manipulating space, of course, became more central to some of the exercises. Um, and here you can see on the left-hand model, which was produced in response to the exercise, construct a cubic form based on combining mass and space. And so you can see um, how the, the space is integral to the entire structure here. In contrast, the, uh, to the, in contrast, the response to the exercise construct spatial depth as an architectonic composition using angular planes. In this one, the student has created a form that created multiple interactions with the surrounding spatial environment. So one integrates space into it, one, if you like, interacts externally with space. And this, um, oh, sorry. This, uh, this slide here shows a range of the exercises produced in the space and volume discipline. So these, every student went through these different exercises. They learned how to manipulate space, how to manipulate volume, and how to manipulate color on the plane. So this work they were, in theory, going to use in they, when they came to specialize. And here is the painting faculty, and I shall go through the faculties. Um, the basic course embodied avant-garde values, but this was not true of all the other faculties, which often pursued, and I'm afraid promoted, more traditional approaches. And this is particularly true of the painting faculty, where more moderate innovation reigned under the supervision of artists like David Sternberg and Ilya Mashkov. And they often played with space in their work, 
but they remained very true to figuration. And their, their experiments with space were very limited. Students um, similarly employed innovative spatial techniques alongside figurative elements. And this can be seen particularly clearly in these spatially adventurous works by Pimanos and Dienica. These artists have combined different views of various industrial enterprises into single images. These paintings describe current industrial projects. In this respect, they respond to the regime's demands for a figurative art that would promote their industrialization policies. In other words, they are doing what Lenin wanted. They are producing propaganda. But the ways in which these paintings are constructed are highly innovative. And they go much beyond the way David Sternberg and Ilya Mashkov had played with um, space. And in this respect, they are influenced by the kind of avant-garde art which they saw around them by Malievich and Tatlin and others. The sculpture faculty is very similar to this, um, the general position. Boris Korolyov um, was one of the main teachers in it. This slide shows him alongside his students. He's famous for his monuments to Bakunin, which you see on the left, and which employed massive abstract volumes within an overall cubist idiom. Um, and rather like the monument to Karl Marx and the completely abstract monument to Dostoevsky in the middle. Korolyov also produced works in a more figurative style, which seemed to have been, to have been the main inspiration for his students. Um, and you can see here that they are clearly working on a live model. Um, and you can see the kind of figures that he produced later on in the 20s. Yosef Tchaikov also taught in the faculty. His work, as you can see, ranged also from adventurous use of form and space to more conventional figurative sculpture. Um, although the footballer, as you can see, shows a great sense of dynamism, and the figures seem in motion, pivoting around the ball. Um, it also kind of extols the energy and the physical prowess of the new man. So in this way, he also is being um, adventurous. And this um, sculpture actually was outside the Dinamo um, uh, Stadium in Moscow for years, but um, has now been restored and is in the Tretikov Gallery. And students produced very similar kind of work. The graphics faculty, um, the faculty taught various printing techniques alongside drawing and typography. Um, and therefore, the, the students learned about book design, book illustration, poster design, poster production. Vladimir Favorsky, whose work you see here, was a strong influence on the students. There was a strong element of decoration and elegance in his work, which a lot of students emulated. But they also experimented quite freely with lettering and with other styles of depiction. Here are several examples of their experiments. And I particularly like this one for the Komsomol by, by Sotnina, but also Olga Denica's work design for the work, um, for work called Trude. It's a kind of logo. And you can see how marvelously she's combined the T with the R and the Y, which is like a, a, with, which, U, which is like a, 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 an Ita a Latin Y, and the D. I love this particular little, little D, which looks like a top hat at the bottom. Um, and the, the graphics faculty were, students produced a lot of propaganda. This is what they were trained for, and they did this. Um, and the, skilled the skills that the students acquired were applied to various tasks, particularly in the production of posters and journals. And in the at the local club, which you see on the left, Danica highlights the various activities that the new workers' clubs provided. Their aim was to create the new physically and ideologically well-educated new man. So you have sport at the top, um, then education and literacy activities, and then ideologically sound and uplifting entertainment through films. Lenin, of course, was one of the first um, political leaders to consider film an important um, art form. Um, in his Enigma to an Old Man in 1929, you can just see the old man right at the bottom, bottom right. Um, and he, here, Danica is showing the new kind of industrial activity with women taking a very important role. And this, of course, shocks 
the old man who is given this kind of bubble, indicating that he's part of the old regime, part of the old religious order. And then I'm showing Olga Danica's No Relation, um, a book is everyone's friend, look after books. And of course, the literacy campaign of the Bolsheviks was incredibly important, and books were an incredibly important part of this campaign as well. Um, so these examples, I think, oh, sorry, show the importance that the students devoted to propaganda. And this became more important with the collectivization of agriculture and the, um, and the setting up of the first five-year plan in 1928 to 9. Posters became concerned with the policies of industrialization and collectivization. Klutzes, who we know taught in the, um, in the basic course, produced numerous examples. His striking use of black and red and the way he manipulated from photo montage created effective posters and inspired other artists to emulate him and to manipulate time and space on the flat sheet of the paper. And as you can see, Alexander Dienica has taken this lesson to heart, um, where the figures are painted, though, instead of being photographs. I think these range of examples show that, the, to a large extent, the graphics faculty achieved the political and artistic objectives of the party, but only partly a, a kind of obeyed the artistic objectives of the avant-garde. And I think this is a very similar picture with the textile faculty. Um, the main figures in innovative textile design at this time were Lubov Popova and Varvara Stepanova, who both worked for the first state textile printing works in Moscow. They produced designs based on manipulating simple geometric forms and using one or two colors. Popova died in 1924, but Stepanova worked on in the textile fac faculty and in the um, factory um, alongside other teachers, including Oskar Grun, whose work is here in the middle. Now, Oskar Grun was not an artist, but he'd worked in the textile industry and was responsible for teaching the production processes for the students. His own designs are rather fussy, and this is one of the least fussy ones, and they really replace the flowers and vegetation of pre-revolutionary designs with modern objects. In this instance, electric light bulbs. And of course, the electrification of Russia was an important policy put forward by Lenin in December 1920. He said, um, communism equals the electrification of the whole, the Soviets plus the electrification of the whole country. Popova and Stepanova had insisted on the relationship between the design of the fabric and the actual item of clothing. Develop, they developed the notion of production clothing or specialist clothing. In this slide, you can see Stepanova's designs for sports clothing, which is also based on simplicity, functionality, and economy. The students tended to work in a more traditional direction, although some of the designs use saturated colors, bold outlines, and a strict economy of color and form. Industrial forms, as you can see, abounded, reflecting the industrial ethos of socialism and the new workers' state. So we see aeroplanes, tractors, construction and transportation. And so these fabrics, in their essence, were tied to the essence of the new society. Some designs were less figurative. As you can see here, this um, Zinaida Marquina produced designs which used various shapes and colors without a white ground, producing dense patterns. While one looks like stylized flowers, the other produces a sensation of wheels, although the red and green evoke a rural rather than an industrial and urban ethos. Initially, the faculty had included printing, weaving, and embroidery as its three sections, but embroidery was soon abandoned. Um, it had, in the pre-revolutionary period, embroidery had been used for very important state gowns and things like this, and actually there wasn't much call for aristocratic gowns um, under the Soviets. So instead, they, um, <coughs> Lydia Ma Mayakovskaya, um, who was um, Vladimir Mayakovsky's um, sister, in fact, um, introduced a new um, 
a new department which was ba based on airbrushing, the technique of airbrushed forms um, using abstract shapes. And this is one of her examples here. She used um, kind of lovely fine silks and kind of velvets, so, which added to the kind of um, elusive quality, if you like, of the forms. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the students of the faculty independently developed the notion of agitational textiles. And this is an important development which was generated by the students from within the Futemas. Uh, the images, such as um, Lila Ryatz's mechanization, tie in directly with government policy. They are figurative and they are descriptive and they are propaganda. Eventually, however, this approach to textile design was abandoned because as one con consumer and critic complained, nobody wanted to go around looking like a poster. The textile faculty did, however, make a lasting contribution to the Soviet textile industry, both in terms of design and manufacture. Over a hundred graduates entered the factories and improved factory production. When you look at books of Soviet um, fabric design, of, um, you will undoubtedly come across numerous names of students who graduated from the faculty and went into um, production. The teaching in the ceramics faculty also represented a mixture of innovation and tradition. In the later 1920s, Vladimir Tatlin joined the staff and inspired the student Alexei Sotnikov to produce a range of new and exciting designs. Tatlin's nursing vessel, which you can see here, is based on the form of the human breast, and it acted as a basis for Sotnikov's series of nursing vessels that be, could, could be used to feed babies in the numerous orphanages in the Soviet Union. The First World War and the Civil War had, along with the famines had, and political and social disruption, had produced a vast number of orphanages, orphan, orphans sorry, who were cared for in not very nice orphanages. Um, let's hope they had these, they had got some comfort from these nice vessels. Um, the faculty also produced kind of propaganda figurines, um, both for domestic and foreign consumption. They were often given to delegates and important visitors, as well as being sold um, to the few tourists who ventured into Russia at this time. And they also became kind of artifacts sold at fairs and in shops abroad. In 1922, for instance, the faculty produced a large number of designs for the delegates of the Third Congress of the Comintern held in Moscow that summer. And I think they probably got um, a figurine like the one of Lenin. I don't think they yet got Stalin. I think he came later. <clears throat> so the ceramics faculty is a very mixed bag, not particularly innovative. But the two faculties, which later became one, that did promote a very adventurous approach to design are the woodwork faculty and the metalwork faculty. And they became eventually the wood and metalwork faculty, which was called, as you might be, Dermet Fac, <laughs> which is, I, I love it. Anyway, on here you can see um, Levinsky's sales kiosk of 1924. And if you recall the kind of um, experiments which students were doing, you can see that he's inverted the pyramid. He's rethought the whole sense of the kiosk to make an object which is um, functional but also arresting, doesn't take up, its footprint is very small, and the flaps at the bottom go up to kind of secure the, um, the, where, where, the, where the sales take place. And the rest of it just acts as a show, show window. So it's, it was a very clever design, very cleverly thought out. And when I was in Moscow, way back in the time, you could actually see still a few of these on the streets. They weren't in very good condition by then, of course. And the Levinsky, for the, um, for the um, 1925 Paris exhibition, um, the students, along with Levinsky, um, produced a rural reading room. And as you can see from the plan, it's based on a square but tipped around um, to be um, a diamond. And this, of course, was using space in a very simple way but to make it arresting on the streets. And the streets of villages tended to be 
in lines, and this broke up the lines, it rested the viewer and was a centre, but also gives a sense of going forward, it gives, it gives a sense of advancement, which is also visually important in this way. So this was the work, the Izba Chitanaya, the rural reading room, was like the workers' club. It was a centre, an important crucible for inculcating um, the Soviet message, the communist message um, to the people, but as also a kind of educational centre, although I don't think they did much sports there, but they certainly would have sure, um, looked at films. In Paris, too, the metalwork faculty um, produced this, the Workers' Club, which was primarily, it seems to have been, designed by Rodchenko. Although it was made in wood and only made in Paris, um, it epitomized Rodchenko's approach to teaching and design and to the way he was teaching his students within the metalwork faculty. As you can see, each element is composed of very um, simple uh, geometric shapes. So you have the circle at the top of the chair linked by a semicircular seat and then three pieces of wood at the bottom and three upright. So it's very economic in terms of material, it's very economic in the sense of the space it occupies, but also very economic in terms of industrial processes. Russia was rich in wood, it had a lot of wood. It also had a lot of experience in handling wood and manufacturing wood. And so using wood in this way was very, um, very good, interesting way of, of doing it um, instead of metal. And the other items are equally innovative. So the um, table has flaps which lay out so you could make a poster, but then if the flaps came down and you could put books, as you see here, along the side. And it was coloured. This is a reconstruction here on the left. It was given to the French Communist Party, who promptly lost it, I think. Anyway, so what space was important, material, economy of space, material, and this is evident in here. This is the, um, the um, chess table, which didn't occupy much space and which the, rota the table rotated, so you couldn't leave until all the pieces are gone. And here is um, Vladimir Mayakovsky uh, smoking a papyrosi and playing at the bottom. And this is, um, on the right, is a tribune, um, which again collapses. It was for um, talks, but also for the display of posters and other elements. Everything was collapsible and space-saving, multifunctional. Dermot, in fact, also <coughs> derived some inspiration from Earl Lizitsky, who'd lived in the West for several years. And Tatlin, of course, also um, worked in Dermot Fack. Um, and I'm showing here um, a Lizitsky interior for a two-person apartment in a communal house. It was the Narcom Finn building, which was designed by constructivist architects um, Ginsberg and Milanis in 1928, and is there in Moscow. I'll show you in a minute. Um, and you can see that um, what you'll notice is that though there are bathroom facilities, there's very little facility for cooking. And this was the idea that you ate communally. You didn't kind of sit on your flat, flat and kind of heat up your microwave meal, if you ever had such a thing. Um, so um, there you see um, Galaktionov's um, stainless steel chair, which is clearly inspired by a Bauhaus design um, by Breuer's um, a club chair and Rogozin's um, Claire, which is um, chair, sorry, which is which is designed under the guidance of Vladimir Tatlin. And at above, you can see two designs: um, one by Toporkov, um, a desk and a table, which you can see that the item collapses and performs multifunctions. And on the right is a design by Zimin, uh, a desk and table of 19. Both of these are about 1928. So the Dermet fact was in fact one of the areas in which constructivist ideals, using art to make useful things for everyday life, um, was achieved. Although I have to stress, none of these items obey, went into mass production. So they're full of ideas, full of ideas of how they want to transform the environment, but nothing much, I'm afraid, gets made. And finally, the architecture faculty, which is again um, one of the faculties which expresses, epitomizes avant-garde ideals. Um, there, it consisted of certain different factions. So there's the constructivist faction, which was um, taught mainly by um, Moise Ginsberg and um, Alexander Vesnin, as you can see here. These two architects devised something which they called the functional method. They analyzed the brief of the building 
and they then devised the spaces that were required to fulfill those functions and then put them together. And they expressed how the building was to be built or the structure of the building on the exterior. And so you can see this um, in the Len Vesnin brothers. Vesnin worked, Alexander worked with his uh, two brothers, Leonid and um, Victor. And this is the Leningrad Pravda building. Um, it wasn't actually built, but this is a very small site. And they built, they, they designed this wonderful um, small kind of um, structure. Um, which has kind of allusions to mines, to the latest technology. Um, it has a digital kind of clock, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a kind of expression of modernity, but also the dynamism of the new world, the transparency of the new structures which they hoped, um, and the spaces are allocated. It wasn't. It shows the printing presses, the kind of allusion to the printing presses on the exterior as well. And this is a later project, um, or this is an earlier project by the Vesnian brothers for the Palace of Labour. And here you can see again, they've, they've used this idea of the spaces, it was an auditorium, um, and which you can see on the right, plus um, other functional office spaces. And they've combined the functional spaces into an ensemble and then shown the structure, in this sense, instance, reinforced concrete on the exterior of the building. Um, they also, um, the constructivists, were very concerned with new structures for the new society, these what they called social condensers. And one of the most famous of these, of course, is the Narcon Fin building, which is, you can still see in Moscow today. It looks a bit like this, um, but it should look, as you can see on the right, which one hoped is what it looked like at the time. It was a residential communal project. It was building which was supposed to transition towards a totally communist society, to encourage people to live in a communal manner and then to kind of reject, if you like, to grow out of the last re residual elements of individuality and become socialist man. So being determines consciousness, according to Marxism, and here is being. So this was the kind of project that they were looking for. And this is actually realized, um, as you can see here. Um, and you can see the different kinds of flats for families, for, for single people, and also for couples. And so it was kind of indoor. The corridors of this long building were like inside. But of course, what you notice here is that it changed, that this obeys much more a Le Corbusier's five points of architecture with the ribbon windows, the um, smooth surfaces, the pilotis, and the roof garden, um, much more than their earlier sense of showing the reinforced ex um, concrete frame on the exterior of the building. Alongside the constructivist kind of um, uh, section was um, Melnikov and Golosov. And they were very much concerned with expressive form, the sense of giving an expression to the ideas. And you can see here Golosov's um, Zuyev Club combines literally the cylinder and the cube um, in this very elaborate structure. And Melnikov's um, Rusakov Workers Club was for the workers who um, worked in the Rusakov factory, which actually produced trams. And he's expressing, if you like, the reality of their everyday life um, in the building. This, and Melnikov, throughout Moscow, there are, there are all sorts of buildings which have this incredibly visual kind of expression of their function on their exterior. But there is a, there are, well, their students didn't necessarily emulate their, um, their approach. Um, Ladovsky um, is the other kind of important, very important avant-garde sector um, of the architectural faculty. And he was very concerned with what he called the psychoanalytic method. And this focused on the response of the viewer, of orchestrating the response of the viewer, of making the viewer kind of a more socialist man. So the, the students were had to examine the psychological impact of geometric forms, mass and stability, mass and balance, open and closed spaces, construction, dynamism, um, rhythm, and the proportions of vertical and horizontal structures. And you can see here some of the different projects that these students devised. And you can see that these aren't very practical 
but boy, do they make an impression. And it's this, this sense of experiment, experimenting with form and how it could act on the observer, which is very crucial and it lays the, work, the ground, if you like, for a much more innovative, practical approach um, later on. Um, and I'm just showing you here some of the range of items that were shown um, in the student work of the faculty. Um, on the left, at the top left, is the 1923, the first year um, student work in the architectural faculty. Um, but here, a much more variety, much more finished products, a great, a great sense of using these ideas for more practical ends, um, as you can see here. Um, and here's some more designs I've showed you, just really because this, this effervescence of experimentation was encouraged. Students from being tramlined in previous pre-revolutionary education were now encouraged to think, to be imaginative, to think about form in a new way. And you can see that here. But you can also see this is Krutikov's project for an education institution. These early ones are very fanciful visions, kind of imaginative visions, and this becomes much more practical. So these, that sense of vision is combined with a more practical approach. And then I'm just going to discuss two final um, architectural projects which are very famous. Um, this is um, Ivan Leonidov's graduation project in 1927 for the um, Lenin Librarian Institute. And this was to store five, 15 million books. <laughs> and you can see that the spaces are articulated, are transformed into pure geometric form. The sense of the functional space is kind of here taken to a new level where the functional space also becomes a visual, a visual space, a space which has its own visual identity both internally and externally. And it also was to have an auditorium of 250 to 4,000 people. So this, the sphere would also be able to act as a science theater and a planetarium as well as an auditorium. And the project includes the very latest technology. So there was an elevated railway um, envisaged to link the institute to the center of Moscow. And of course, there was the invariable radio station. The radio station was to the avant-garde in 1920s what the internet is to the people today. It was an essential element in any kind of structure that is going to be, be um, built. And finally, um, there's Georgi Krutikov's also graduation project of 1921, um, which is the flying city. Um, Krutikov argued that the surface of the earth was far too um, filled up with all sorts of terrible structures, and that man could work on the earth, but he needed to breathe, breathe fresh air. So where is fresh air available? Krutikov argued it was in space, and so these are for residential complexes in space, and you were able to kind of travel to and from work in this wonderful little capsule over here. It's a vision. Um, I'm not sure that he ever thought it would happen, but he, this project of kind of seeing a future of imagination is, um, is what kept um, the artists and um, architecture in the Soviet Union um, from becoming completely um, socialist realist. <laughs> so during its existence, um, the, the Futamas produced a lot of very different designs. The experiments of the avant-garde formed the basis for the basic course. And it was the basic course that underpinned the intensive experimentation with design and the fine arts that was conducted at the Futamas during the 1920s. By the time that it closed in 1930, the school had fostered numerous talents and had produced many notable projects of imagination in, and um, utility. Its most innovative creations and achievements were, of course, the basic course and the work that various faculties um, produced, such as architecture, the textile track faculty, and der Metfac. And it's these items which continue to inspire some educational and other projects in the Soviet Union and in Russia today. Thank you. <laughs>